Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Brad Berzer. I hope you guys all remember me. And uh, here we are in our, our plague class. So trying to do this online, and hopefully everything will work just fine here. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how this is all going to work. Um, I was able to do a Western, actually, American Heritage class yesterday, and I think it went really well. That one was actually for today, and I'm recording right now for class tomorrow, so for our 9.30 Christian Humanism class, but I'll post it this afternoon so that you can get it as early as you can. And I'll try and do that for uh, this this week. I'll try and make sure that these online courses are available about uh, 12 hours or so before our class actually meets. I hope that's acceptable for everyone. So again, hello everybody. Uh, I've missed you. It's been Wow, uh, too long since I've seen you all. And of course, you guys, right when I left you, you took your midterm and you did very well. I was very, very happy with those. So I, I need to, I've got all those and I need to send those grades back to you. So thank you for the kind of time that you put into those. I, I was very impressed. But I guess what I'll have to do, since I won't see you for a while, uh, I mean, assuming you guys all come back next week, I guess I could just hand them back then. Uh, but I might go ahead and send the grades to you individually. Anyway, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll get that figured out. I would like to remind everybody that uh, all the assignments are still due. You still have your paper due from me. Hopefully you're able to do that from home and especially with access to the internet. And then of course, we'll still have a final. So those two things are still due. I also would like to make sure that you do the readings in particular, and we're going to talk about this today, a uh, canicle for Leibowitz. So I don't know how many of you would have had time to have read it over spring break, over this previous break. I, there are copies, fair use copies in the Dropbox. I have them in two different forms. So if you do need it, if you left your book at, at school and you're not able to get that, I have those in the Dropbox. So you can either read them as the articles that they originally were. So they, they actually came out as three short stories, not articles, but three short stories in fantasy and science fiction. I, you can read them that way, or you can read the novel. I have both in the Dropbox. Again, that's all fair use. Uh, so you, you should have bought the copy anyway, but this is a way if you need it while you're at home. You can do that. I've got my copy right here, and I'm going to be going going over it here in just a little bit. So, all right, second half of the semester, a little bit cut short, but second half of the semester. First half of the semester, as you all know, uh, we studied Christian humanism, and we looked pretty in-depth at people like Irving Babbitt and Paul Elmer Moore, and especially... My gosh, my my favorite, T.S. Eliot. We had, uh, at least I had a great time looking at T.S. Eliot and thinking about everything from the Wasteland to the Hollow Men to Ash Wednesday to uh, especially the Four Quartets. I just, uh, even saying the Four Quartets, I get a little little patter in my heart. I know that sounds goofy, but it is true. Um, one of those just kind of, I don't know, fanboy excitements uh, just hits. So today what I want to do is I want us to start us off in the second half of the semester. And there are two things I would like to do for this lecture. So number one, I want to talk just a little bit about what happens during World War II and how things change. So we left little getting right in the middle of World War II. You guys had your break. And now, essentially, I'd like us to think that we're in about 1946, 1947, 48, and what's happened. So prior to World War II, as I think was probably pretty obvious, there were no concerted movements that would have been called conservative. And by conservative here, I mean this in the sense of what is it that people wanted to conserve of the past? What kinds of traditions, what kinds of habits, what kinds of laws, norms, customs? What did they want to do? What, what did they believe was worth preserving from all that came before? And you have individual figures that arise, uh, people earlier, much earlier, like Edmund Burke or Alexis de Tocqueville, who clearly present what we would now call a conservative vision of society. But nobody had really articulated that. That is, there hadn't been anyone who had just said, uh, this is what a conservative is, this is what a conservative does and so forth. Even someone like Irving Babbitt 
who often identified himself as a conservative, didn't use that term. He used the term humanist more than anything else. And someone like Paul Elmer Moore actually said there was no reason to be a conservative. Uh, in our day and age, you might as well be a reactionary. And you should embrace the term reactionary. This should really be what you stand for. So there was a lot of discussion among those people who were essentially not left-wing, who were trying to figure out exactly what all of this meant. That is, what is it that we might want to conserve? Now, it will not be until we get to Russell Kirk that we actually have an articulate vision of what conservatism is and what it stands for. And Kirk will come along and do that between 1948 and 1940, uh, and 1952. We will get to that in a little bit, but we're not there yet. So I want us to think again, what's happening in the 1930s and the 1940s? So let's actually jump back a little bit before the 1930s. Let's imagine that it's uh, 1929. We'll put it in September 1st of 1929. And let's say that uh, you're still students at Hillsdale. You know, in, in terms of what Hillsdale looked like in 1929, September, October of 1929 would have looked very similar to what your class looks like right now in March of 2020, uh, even though that was uh, almost 100 years ago. Same kind of demographic breakdown in terms of racial makeup, in terms of ethnic makeup, in terms of gender division. So pretty similar. And if we were to have asked Hillsdale students, what do they believe in in 1929? They, like all students around the country, would have had a very difficult time saying, this is what I stand for. They would have known what they didn't like, but they would have had a very difficult time saying, this is what I actually believe. Not what I don't like, but what I do like and what I stand for. So clearly, I, I'm not going to believe in fascism. I'm not going to believe in communism. But it's one thing to not believe in those things, and it's another thing to have a belief in something beyond that. Uh, that's, that's a hard thing. And in 1929, Religion had been so mocked because of the Scopes trial, and ideology had done such a runaround job on science and had created, as, as Dr. Kaltoff so beautifully lectures, scientism, had created a kind of ideology around science and evolution, all of which may have been true to a certain extent, but of course was exaggerated. So you have an attack on education, you have an attack on religion, you have an attack on science, and about the only thing that really remains in, say, September or early October of 1929 is faith in the free market. And then what happens? We have the stock market crash, and everything just falls apart, and our economy just does an absolute nosedive, and not for a month or two months or three months, but for 16 years, the thing is in the dumps. And nobody had ever experienced anything like that before. And you can imagine if this were fall semester of 1929, it would be very difficult to have students define exactly what they believe in because everything that America had really stood for had been taken down. Even belief in constitutional government had been replaced by the progressive vision. And so there had been attacks everywhere. Now, you may remember from when you took your American heritage that there was a piece that you all had to read by Walter Lippmann called The Dominant Dogma of the Age. And Lippmann talks about what, hap what happens when we lose our belief in all things. What we find, of course, is that when we do lose our belief in all things, we don't turn to atheism. That is very rare. There are very few actual atheists in the history of the world. Uh, atheism can never really pass on what it is because it's a negative. And so people will almost always believe in something. The danger is if they don't believe in something real, they'll make and exaggerate something that is only partially real and they'll make a god out of it. That's the great danger. So it's not that we're going to lose all faith. It's that we'll lose faith in, say, Judeo-Christianity, and at that point we'll turn to something like uh, movie stars, or drugs, or alcohol, or 
whatever it may be. Uh, anything that becomes kind of a false god. For, for us, for academics, for those of us in the room, we may turn to knowledge uh, as a kind of false god. We may turn to certainty, uh, this desire to know all things, a kind of Gnosticism. So it, it is possible that all peoples, and probable, that all peoples will turn to something when, they don't, when they're not given something legitimate to believe in. And as we talked about in the first half of the semester, we saw in the 19th century all kinds of possibilities of what one might believe in. They might believe only in evolution, or they might believe only in communism, or they might believe only in the nation state, or they might believe only in psychology. And as C.S. Lewis will say, yet yeah, these things are not wrong communism is, but the belief in community is not. Uh, these things are not necessarily wrong, but what you've done is you've taken one truth and you've exploded it to madness. That is, you've taken one truth and you've ignored 999 other truths. And that's hard. Uh, that's very difficult. It's hard on society. It's hard on us as individuals. So Walter Lippmann tries to describe what happens in the 1930s when people lose their faith in the traditional things such as the Constitution or the Declaration or Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, we lose those traditional ideas. And what do we say? What do we find? He writes in The Dominant Dogma of the Age, In the violent conflicts which now trouble the earth, the active contenders believe that since the struggle is so deadly, it must be that the issues which divide them are deep. I think they are mistaken. Because parties are bitterly opposed, sorry, can't turn the page properly here. It's the problem when you turn age 52 and your fingers get all fumbly. All right, let me do that again. Not the fumbly part. Well, yeah, that may happen too. Because parties are bitterly opposed, it does not necessarily follow that they have radically different purposes. The intensity of their antagonism is no measure of the divergence of their views. There has been many a ferocious quarrel among sectarians who worship the same God. <laughs> How sadly true. Right? Many ferocious quarrel among sectarians who worship the same God. Although the partisans who are now fighting for the mastery of the modern world wear shirts of different colors, their weapons are drawn from the same armory their doctrines are variations of the same theme, and they go forth to battle, singing the same tune with slightly different words. Their weapons are the coercive direction of life and labor of mankind. Their doctrine is that of disorder and misery that can be overcome only by more and more compulsory organization. Their promise is that through the power of the state, men can be made happy. Right, through the power of the state. All solutions come down to politics. All solutions come down to politics having an absolute tyranny over all other spheres of life. The sphere of politics expands so that all others become only spheres within the sphere of politics. And what an incredible danger that is to our tradition and to our society, to our ability to associate one with another. Throughout the world in the name of progress, here are the progressives, men who call themselves communists, socialists, fascists, nationalists, progressives, and even liberals are unanimous in holding that government with its instruments of coercion must, by commanding the people how they shall live, direct the course of civilization and fix the shape of things to come. They believe in what Mr. Stuart Chase accurately describes as the overhead planning and control of economic activity. This is the dogma which all prevailing dogmas presuppose. This is the mold in which are cast the thought and the action of the epoch. No other approach to the regulation of human affairs is seriously considered or is even conceived as possible. The recently enfranchised masses and the leaders of thought who supply their ideas are almost completely under the spell of this dogma. Only a handful here and there, groups without influence, isolated, disregarded thinkers continue to challenge it.
For the premises of authoritarian collectivism have become the working beliefs, the self-evident assumptions, the unquestioned axioms, not only of all the revolutionary regimes, but of nearly every effort which lays claim to being enlightened, humane, and progressive. So universal is the dominion of this dogma over the minds of contemporary men that no one is taken seriously as a statesman or a theorist who does not come forward with proposals to magnify the power of public officials and to extend and multiply their intervention in human affairs. I imagine the sphere of politics has become the only sphere. It has not just crowded out spheres of religion, spheres of charity, spheres of friendship. It has permeated and oppressively imperialized themselves itself over all others. Unless one is an authoritarian and a collectivist, he is a mossback, a reactionary, at best an amiable eccentric swimming hopelessly against the tide, and it is a strong tide. Though despotism is no novelty in human affairs, it is probably true that at no time in 2,500 years has any Western government claimed for itself a jurisdiction over men's lives comparable with that which is officially attempted in the totalitarian states. No doubt there have been despotisms which have been more cruel than those of Russia, Italy, and Germany. There have been none which were more inclusive. In these ancient centers of civilization, several hundred millions of persons live under what is theoretically the absolute dominion of the dogma that public officials are their masters and that only under official orders may they live, work, and seek their salvation. For all intents and purposes, politics has become its own religion. And that is truly terrifying. But this is what happened in the 1930s and the 1940s. In the 1930s, as we developed this massive welfare state, and then in the late 1930s, early 1940s, as that transitioned into a massive warfare state. They're, they're identically related one to another. The welfare state becomes the warfare state. The warfare state was the welfare state. So all dogma, Lippmann tells us, comes from this idea that we have to centralize all power, and through that centralization of power, we must act. And only ideas and men who believe in using the political levers of government, only they have any qualifications. Those of us at a place like Hillsdale, who believe that we should be left alone to educate as we see fit, we become the reactionaries, we become the mossbacks, we become the great dangers to society. And one of the elements that we talked about in the first half of the semester about progressivism, one of its most important beliefs, is that history is in alterably moving towards this form of utopia, whatever that utopia is, but it's moving in that direction. And if you as a human person try to stop that movement of history, you will be defeated, but you might slow down history enough to cause problems. That's the great danger. And this is why when we talked about Lenin, Lenin said, when there's a famine, you let the farmers die. You don't get involved because if you get involved, you may give hope to the farmers and they then may believe in the system. It is better to let all things fall and let history take its course. So the only real sin in progressivism is standing athwart history because you can put a bump into it. You can derail it for a moment. Now, it'll only be for a moment and history will crush you. But in those moments, you have slowed down progress towards utopia. That is exactly the great danger. And this is what the progressives fear. So, if you're not a progressive, what are you? Well, as we know, there were a lot of people who were not progressives. T.S. Eliot, was not a progressive. Irving Babbitt was not a progressive. Paul M. Moore, Christopher Dawson, these men were not progressives. And so we do find that there were about five major schools of thought between about 1900 
and roughly 1953 that opposed progressivism, but they did so in a variety of different ways. Now, I've mentioned these schools of thought to you, but I want to go over them in a little bit of detail today, especially as background to what we're going to talk about in Canical for Leibowitz. So, without question, and the one that you are the most familiar with, we have already talked about school number one, and that is the humanists, the new humanists, people like Babbitt, or T.E. Holm, or Moore, or more specifically, the Christian humanists, like Christopher Dawson, others I haven't really talked about, Nicholas Berdyaev, but we talked a lot about T.S. Eliot. And so there's always that element there of these humanists who are trying to preserve the humanities, who are trying to preserve a proper view of the human person as below God, but above the animals, below the angels, but above nature or a part of nature in some kind of extraordinary way. We have these humanists who are defending the great books and the great ideas and the great civilizations, be they Hindu or Confucian or Buddhist or Judeo-Christian. They're trying to defend these high civilizations against the barbarians, and they truly did not believe in progressivism. In fact, they stood exactly against progressivism because they thought progressivism was exactly what it was, that it was a tyrannical, super, superficial attempt to arrive at utopia, that it could never be done without great bloodshed, that it could never be done humanely, and therefore they opposed it. Plus, the progressives almost always thought that we needed to start over on day one or year one or year zero and ignore the past. And that's not going to go over well with people like Babbitt or Moore or Eliot, who have such a strong belief in the idea of tradition and what Chesterton would call the democracy of the dead. The second school that arises in the 19 aughts, the 19 teens, the 1920s, 30s, and 40s is a school that is divided between those adherents in England and those in the southern parts of the United States. Overall, we would call these people agrarians, those who believe that there is something truly good about small town life. In our current day, uh, the most famous agrarian by far would be a Kentuckian by the name of Wendell Berry. But these are people who believe very strongly in local life. They believe in association. They believe that most of us should own property, if not all of us, that rather than having concentrations of property. We have wide distribution of property. In England, they were called distributists, and they were led by Hilaire Belloc and G.K. Chesterton. In America, they were led by people like Alan Tate and Donald Davidson and people like Robert Penn Warren, a couple of others, these Southern agrarians who were trying to fight against what they called and understandably called Leviathan, against the idea of the federal government controlling all things. So, what happens? The belief is, among the agrarians, that capitalism is a wicked force. But what they mean by capitalism is not necessarily what we would mean at Hillsdale in 2020. We typically, in 2020, think of capitalism, especially those of us at Hillsdale, we tend to think of it as synonymous with the free market. The agrarians and the distributists had an exact, a very different view than that. What they believed was that capitalism was the control by capital, that is banking and large businesses of the state, and maybe vice versa. But it was this really unhealthy relationship of business and government working together to benefit one another. And they created corporation laws to make businesses not people and to protect them from lawsuits. They got tariffs or free trade. Uh, they could both be equally beneficial to a large business, but detrimental to the consumer and to the average person. But the idea was that big business would get into bed with government, and it would form Leviathan. That is, it would benefit only the wealthy and the elite. What would have been called in this time period, not, we don't use this term anymore, but it would have been called plutocracy, the rule of the rich. And they believed that capitalism was nothing more than a fancy name for plutocracy. And so they opposed 
the idea of Leviathan coming out of Washington or out of London, depending on whether they were English agrarians or American agrarians. They opposed that, but they especially opposed any special privileges to large businesses. And so they were fighting against what we in 2020 would call crony capitalism. That to them was capitalism. There was no such thing as crony capitalism. All capitalism was crony capitalism by their definition. Now, where the agrarians are a little odd compared to many of the other peoples that we're going to talk about here this morning, the agrarians were a little strange. Different. I mean, by strange, I don't mean eerie, but different. They were different in that they still very much believed in the power of government, but they wanted all government to be local government. So if this county in Kentucky wanted to pass noise ordinances and wanted to pass zoning restrictions and wanted to pass crop limitations, it had every right to do so. The objection was that the federal government could not do it because it was too distant from the people, but local governments could. So the Southern agrarians don't ever think of them as libertarian. They're not libertarian. They hate Leviathan, but they are completely fine with local government. Not at all with national government, but they are with local government. They believed that local government was just another form of association, one in which the people could express themselves politically, and therefore through that political effort, really kind of determine their own culture and their own way of life. So I'm not going to talk much more about the Southern Agrarians for the rest of the semester, but I do want you to know that they were an important school of thought and really critical for forming at least parts of conservatism in the 20th century, uh, the second half of the 20th century, and especially an influence on that father of modern conservatism on Russell Kirk. The third skill, school of thought would be the anarchists. And I realize that when I say anarchist, most of us almost immediately think of Victorian men with bad mustaches throwing bombs, right? That's the anarchist means bomb thrower. And if I were to say, for example, uh, to talk to my mother, who's brilliant and well-read, but if I were to talk to her about anarchism, she would immediately get very, very, very worried and think that I had become some kind of pro-violent terrorist. That's not the kind of anarchist I'm talking about. In the first half of the 20th century, there were a number of people who had taken their ideas from the 19th century, from people like Henry David Thoreau and others. Uh, I can't pronounce his name because it's French, but Proudhon, uh, forgive me if I got that totally wrong. But these were very famous 19th century men who advocated no government. And when they talked about anarchy, they literally meant a society without government. They did not mean violence. In fact, they thought it would be just the opposite. They thought that government itself, politics, was the cause of violence. And if we could get rid of the political realm, the levers of power, if we could decentralize all things, at that point, once we did that, then we have this ability to understand ourselves and one another, and we can form communities. We can form families and colleges and, and schools, and we can form religions and businesses. So they have a slightly utopian view of man. They don't necessarily think that man is good, but they don't trust man with power, and they believe that decentralized men are better than centralized man. So this is part of what they're trying to argue. And they believe that the Marxists, they believe that the fascists, that these people are unbelievably deadly to society. But they also would argue what de Tocqueville argued, that a democracy can be just as deadly and totalitarian, though usually more pleasant, than an obvious totalitarian power, like a communist power would be. So again, in the 19th century, we have really important figures like Henry David Thoreau, the most important American anarchist, and then the greatest European anarchist, Proudhon. In the early part of the 20th century, we have a very prominent man who was eccentric to be sure, but a very prominent man who will influence all kinds of people. He will influence Russell Kirk very directly, Bill Buckley, founder of National Review, very directly. He will influence those who found the foundation for economic education. So he will have an influence 
on kind of mainstream conservatism, on radical libertarianism, and on the kind of popular conservatism of a Bill Buckley. This is a guy, very importantly, uh, a very interesting guy by the name of Albert J. Nock. Uh, last name is spelled N-O-C-K. He wrote a book, which I actually think is his weakest book, but I need to read it again to kind of judge. I, I haven't read it for probably 15 years or so back when I went to a conference on it for Liberty Fund run by my good friend Jim Otteson. Uh, but I didn't think much of the book at the time, but it's called Our Enemy, the State, published in 1935. Now, what's important about the book is that in it, Nock makes a huge distinction between what is society and what is the state. Society is all of us. It's what we're doing right now in our classroom. The state is that mechanism which, through its own bureaucracy, ensnares and intertwines us through no effort on our own, but through the pure desire of power and ultimately corruption at a higher level. So our enemy is the state, but society or social power is our ally. Very de Tocquevillian. Uh, extremely de Tocquevillian, but also really radical. Knox's solution was you essentially abolish all government. So I'm going to read to you just briefly from Knox and his understanding of what exactly an anarchist is and what he called anarchist promise or progress. And this is from a compilation of his readings, uh, of his writings called The State of the Union. When I was seven years old, playing in front of our house on the outskirts of Brooklyn one morning, a policeman stopped and chatted with me for a few moments. He was a kindly man of Scandinavian blonde type with pleasant blue eyes, and I took to him at once. He sealed our acquaintance permanently by telling me a story that I thought was immensely funny. I laughed over it at intervals all day. I do not remember what it was, but it had to do with the antics of a drove of geese in our neighborhood. He impressed me as the most entertaining and delightful person that I had seen in a long time, and I spoke of him to my parents with great pride. At this time, I did not know what policemen were. No doubt I had not seen them. I had seen them, but I had not noticed them. Now, naturally, after meeting this highly prepossessing specimen, I wished to find out all I could about them, so I took up the matter with the old cook. I learned from her that my fine new friend represented something that was called the law. And the law was very good and great, and that everybody should obey and respect it. I asked where the law came from, and it was explained to me that men all over the country got together on what was called election day, and chose certain persons to make the law, and others to see that it was car car carried out, and that the sum total of all these mechanisms was called our government. This again was as it should be. The men I knew, such as my father, my uncle George, so-and-so down the street, among my neighbors, running them rapidly over in my mind, could do this sort of thing handsomely, and there was probably a good deal in the idea. But what was it all for? What did we have law and government anyway? When I learned that there were persons called criminals, some of them stole, some hurt or killed people, or set fire to houses, and it was the duty of men like my friend the policeman to protect us from them. If he saw any, he would catch them and lock them up, and they would be punished according to the law. A year or so later, we moved to another house in the same neighborhood, only a short distance away. On the corner of the block, rather a long block, behind our house stood a one-story wooden building, very dirty and shabby, called the Wigwam. While getting the lie of my new surroundings, I considered this structure and remarked with disfavor the kind of people who seemed to be making themselves at home there. Someone told me it was a political headquarters. But I did not know what that meant, and therefore did not connect it with my recent researches into law and government. I had little curiosity about the wigwam. My parents never forbade my going there, but my mother once casually told me that it was a pretty good place to keep away from. I agreed with her. Two months later, I heard someone say that election day was shortly coming on, and I sparked up at once. This, then, was the day that the lawmakers were to be chosen. There had been great doings at the wigwam lately. 
in the evenings, too. I had seen noisy processions of drunken loafers passing our house, carrying transparencies and tin torches, and sent up clouds of kerosene smoke. When I had asked what these meant, I was answered in one word, politics, uttered in a disparaging tone, but this signified nothing to me. The fact is that my attention had been attracted by a steam calliope that went along with one of the first calliope, sorry, that went along with one of the first of these processions, and I took it to mean that there was a circus going on. And when I found that there was no circus, I was disappointed and did not care what else might be taking place. On hearing of election day, however, the light broke in on me. I was really witnessing the august performances that I had heard of. All these processions of yelling hoodlums who sweat and stink in the parboiling humidity of the Indian summer evenings, all these squalid goings-on in the wigwam, all these, it seemed, were a part and parcel of an election. I noticed that the men whom I knew in the neighborhood were not prominent in this election. My uncle George for it voted, I remember, and when he dropped in at our house that evening, I overheard him say he was going to the polls for this filthy business. I could make nothing of it. Nothing could be clearer that the leading spirits in the whole affair were dreadful swine, and I wondered by what kind of magic they could bring forth anything so majestic, good, and venerable as the law. But I kept my questionings to myself. For some reason, though as a rule, I was quite a hand for pestering older people about matters that seemed anomalous. Finally, I gave it up as hopeless and thought no more about the subject for three years. An incident of that election night, however, stuck in my memory. Some devoted brother, very far gone in whiskey, fell by the wayside in a vacant lot just back of our house, on his way to the wigwam to await the returns. He lay there all night, mostly in a comatose state. At intervals of something like half an hour, he roused himself up in the darkness, apparently aware that he was not doing his duty by that occasion, and he suddenly sang in chorus, marching through Georgia. But he never could get it quite through three measures of the first bar before relapsing into his drunkenness. It was very funny. He always began so bravely and earnestly and always petered out so lamentably. I often think of him. His general sense of political duty, I must say, still seems to me as intelligent and as competent as that of any man I have met in the many, many years that have gone by since, and his mode of expressing it still seems about as effective as politics can ever get. And there you have Knock. The policeman, dignified, purveyor, and defender of the law. Those who are above the policeman, scum drunken swine, people who are dirty, people who sweat, people who sweat not because of hard work, but because of anxiety. Right? That is what Nock is trying to get at, that his idea of politics is that politics should be taken care of in the private sphere and locally, but not at the federal level and not at the level in which we can have these mechanisms that can control us. So hence, we go from Knox's many, many essays on the meaning of government to his real screed and diatribe against Franklin Roosevelt and against the progressives, specifically our enemy, the state. Now, he had a number of people that he influenced. I've already mentioned that he very strongly influenced Bill Buckley and Russell Kirk, but there are others, some of whom you may know very well, though you may not have been familiar or made the connection. Rose Wilder Lane, the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder, was a devout disciple of Albert J. Nock. Isabel Patterson, a very, very famous writer in the early part of the 20th century, was also a devout follower of Nock. And he promoted their writings, and he was a, a certainly, in his day and age, he was a, a feminist, and really had no truck at all with women entering into the public sphere. In fact, he thought it was great and promoted them wherever he could. But these are the kinds of people who really did side with the anarchists. Now, Rose Wilder Lane was not an anarchist, and neither was Isabel Patterson. They would be what we would call extreme constitutionalist individualists, but they took many of their ideas from Knock, as did Buckley and Kirk as well. The fourth school is quite a bit more moderate 
than that third school of anarchists and individualists. And these would be the people that at Hillsdale we identify with so strongly, the people that we call classical liberals, people like Israel Kurtzner or Ludwig von Mises. And of course, any of you who've been into purgatory and the library, you know very well about the Ludwig von Mises room uh, and uh, the nice set of books that we've got there down there from his library. People like Friedrich Hayek, these are the classical liberals of the early part of the 20th century, almost all of whom were constitutionalists. Very rarely did you find anarchists among them. You would find some anarchists emerging from them, people like Murray Rothbard later, but you didn't have anarchists directly associated with people like Hayek or Mises or later Kurtzner. Uh, these people tended to be very moderate in their constitutionalism, but generally very, very free market and extremely anti-socialist. So I want to just to give you a flavor of these guys, and I, I'm a huge admirer, especially of Friedrich Hayek. I would consider myself, for what it's worth, a Hayekian on many matters. Hayek gave this great speech in December of 1945 at University College in Dublin, Ireland. And the speech was called Individualism True and False. That is, what is a proper form of individualism? What is a false form of individualism? And he says, this entails certain corollaries of which true individualism once more stands in sharp opposition to the false individualism of the rationalists. The first is that the deliberately organized state on the other side and the individual on the one, far from being regarded as the only realities while all the intermediate, intermediate formations and associations are to be deliberately suppressed, as was the aim of the French Revolution, really the great defender of false individualism for Hayek. The non-compulsory conventions of social intercourse are considered as essential factors in preserving the orderly working of human society. The second is that the individual in participating in the social processes must be ready and willing to adjust himself to the changes and to submit to conventions which are not the result of intelligent design, whose justifications in that particular instance may not be recognizable, and which to him will often appear unintelligible and irrational. I need not say much about the first. The true individualist affirms the value of the family and of the common efforts of the small community and group, that it believes in local autonomy and voluntary association, and that indeed its case rests largely on the convent contention that much for which the coercive action of the state is usually invoked can be done better by voluntary collaboration need not be stressed further. There can be no greater contrast to this than the false individualism which wants to dissolve all these smaller groups into atoms which have no cohesion other than the coercive rules imposed by the state, which tries to make all social ties prescriptive instead of using the state mainly as a protection of the individual against the arrogation of coercive powers by the smaller groups quite as important for the functioning of an individualist society as these smaller groupings of men are, the traditions and conventions which evolve in a free society and which out with, without which being enforceable, establish flexible but normally observed rules that make the behavior of other people predictable in a high degree. The willingness to submit to such rules, not merely so long as one understands the reason for them, but so long as one has no definite reasons to the contrary, is an essential condition for the gradual evolution and improvement of the rules of social intercourse, and the readiness ordinarily to submit to the products of a social process which nobody has designed and the reasons for which nobody may understand is as indispensable condition if it is to be possible to dispense with compulsion. 
that the existence of common conventions and traditions among a group of people will enable them to work together smoothly and efficiently with much less formal organization and compulsion than a group without such common background is, of course, a commonplace. But the reverse of this, while less familiar, is probably not less true. That coercion can probably only be kept to a minimum in a society where conventions and traditions have made the behavior of man to a large extent predictable. Now, that is a, a really perfect summation there in December of 1945 of this classical liberalism or a more moderate libertarianism. Uh, that idea of really Burke and de Tocqueville placing it into modern society and notice how much Hayek's speech there in 1945 sounds very much like what we talked about almost 45 minutes ago in Walter Lippmann. Uh, and Lippmann was heavily influenced by Mises and by Hayek as well. Uh, he would be more of a, a modern liberal, Lippmann was, like a Kennedy liberal, than he would have been a classical liberal, but he still had been influenced by the classical liberals. In our day and age, and I'll talk about this more later in the semester, we have a number of great, I mean in 2020, we have a number of very serious, intellectual, great scholars, uh, men of deep, deep learning who are classical liberals, people like Jim Otteson, James Otteson, an uh, incredible scholar of classical liberalism, Tom Woods, Steve Horwitz, um, Sarah Squire. I, I, I could list a number of these people who have done amazing things in terms of their own classical liberal understanding of modern society and people well worth talking about, but we'll do that later in the semester. Okay, so that's four of our five schools. The humanists, both the new humanists, the American humanists, and the Christian humanists, the southern agrarians, the radical anarchists and individualists, and the libertarians, and finally, we get to the last part of what I want to start today, though I don't think we'll get too far in it, and that is those people, the fifth school, who were called the fabulists. We would now call them fantasy or science fiction writers, but the term science fiction didn't really come into usage properly until about 1952. So during this time period that we're talking about, this period from roughly 1900 all the way up until 1952, interesting, I didn't mean for that to, to happen exactly like that, but we don't really have a science fiction or a fantasy in the way that we have thought of traditionally. Now, science fiction and fantasy, you may be wondering, why would this be a, a school of thought? And it is the weirdest of the schools of thought, but for good reason. Uh, science fiction and fantasy from its very beginnings, and we can take it all the way back to Plato and his Republic is in many ways an act of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, the works of Cicero, uh, imagining an ideal Republic. Later, as our own Dr. Steve Smith is so beautifully put, we have the ideas of Thomas More and Utopia, which is basically science fiction. There has always been this idea of fantasy and the notion of writing things that are fantastic, but we won't really see them take off or coalesce until we get to right around 1900. And probably the earliest and greatest of the dystopian or the science fiction novels, and I'll define my terms here in a moment, the greatest of the early novels would be Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Uh, this book coming out in the 1880s was really a masterful attempt to create a, a fantasy setting where you have Hank Morgan, Morgan, tomorrow, German for tomorrow, right? The, the man of tomorrow. And we have Hank Morgan, who is struck on the back of the head by one of his employees. And when he wakes up, he finds himself in 5th century England in the Arthurian court. And he has to, to recreate everything. I'm actually going to pause here for a moment because I want to I want to grab my book. And I don't have it with me, so you guys have to forgive me. I'm still getting this, this whole classroom thing done. Um, so can I pause? Let me see if I can pause here for a moment. I'm afraid it's just going to stop. Okay, 
I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. I just had to grab behind me <clears throat> my copy of Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, which is really the first kind of modern science fiction story. And as I mentioned, this story revolves around this 19th century Connecticut Yankee who works for the Colt Arms Factory, and he is a boss there. That's the term. He ends up showing up in 5th century King Arthur's Court, and he decides one of two things. Number one, he either has gone insane and he's an insane asylum in an insane asylum or number two he is truly in king arthur's court and if the latter is the case he is going to figure out a way to be in charge if the former is the case and he has found himself in an insane asylum well then he's also going to be in charge of that and the word he uses very interestingly because he had been boss at the court called uh, colt arms factory is that he will be boss here he, he wants to do the exact same thing he wants to boss people around but he finds that when he gets to king arthur's court there are all kinds of traditions and customs and the Catholic Church, and all kinds of things that are working against him. And he does his best to fight these things, but in the end, he, he can't do it. And so he takes several boys and raises them so that they will not have been brought up with the customs and the mores and the norms and habits of King Arthur's court, but will instead have 19th century virtues and beliefs, and he can train them and hone them, he and his servant Clarence can do what they need, and they make an army out of these guys. And as it turns out, at the end of the novel, which is one of the bloodiest, most brutal novels I've ever read in my life, uh, at the end, we have Clarence and Hank Morgan and his boys, 50-some odd boys, all with Gatling guns and everything else to defend themselves against 25,000 knights who will be charging them. This is chapter 43, The Battle of the Sand Belt. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'll read a few parts of it. In Merlin's cave, Clarence and I and 52 fresh, bright, well-educated, clean-minded young boys. At dawn, I sent an order to the factories for all of our great works to stop operations and remove all life to a safe distance, as everything was going to be blown up by secret minds, and no telling at what moment, therefore vacate at once. These people knew me. They had confidence in my word. They would clear out without waiting to part their hair. And I could take my own time about dating the explosion. You couldn't hire one of them to go back during the century if the explosion was still impending. We had a week of waiting. It was not dull for me because I was writing all the time. During the first three days, I finished turning my old diary into this narrative. It only required a chapter or so to bring it down to this date. The rest of the week, I took up writing letters to my wife. It was always my habit to write to Sandy every day, whenever we were separate from one another. And now I kept up the habit for love of it, and of her, though I couldn't do anything with the letters, of course, after I had written them. But it put in the time, you see, and was almost like talking. It was almost as if I was saying, Sandy, if you and Hello Central were here in the cave instead of only your photographs, what good times we could have. And then, you know, I could imagine the baby goo-gooing something out in reply with a fist in its mouth and itself stretched across its mother's lap on its back, and she a-laughing and admiring and a-worshipping, and now and then a-tickling under the baby's chin to set it off cackling, and then maybe throwing in a word of answer to me herself, and so on, and so on, and so on. Well, don't you know, I could sit there in the cave with my pen and keep it up that way by the hour with them. Why, it was almost like having us all together again. I had my spies out every night, of course, to get news. Every report made things look more and more impressive. The hosts were gathering, gathering down all the roads and paths of England. The knights were riding and the priests rode with them to hearten these crusaders, this being the church's war. All the nobilities, big and little, were on their way and all the gentry. This was all as was expected. We could thin out this sort of folk to a degree that the people would have nothing to do but just step in front with their republic and... Ah, what a donkey I was. Toward the end of the week, I began to get this large and disenchanting fact through my head that the mass of the nation had swung their caps and shouted for the republic for about one day and there an end. The church, the nobles, the gentry then turned one grand, all-disapproving frown upon them and they shriveled like sheep. 
And from that moment, the sheep had begun to gather to the fold, that is to say, the camps, and offer their valueless lives and their valuable wool to the righteous cause. Why, even the very men who had lately been slaves were in the righteous cause, and they were glorifying it, praying for it, sentimentally slabbering all over it, just like all the other commoners. Imagine such human muck as this. Conceive of the folly. Yes, their cry was now, Death to the Republic! Everywhere there was not a dissenting voice. All of England was marching against us. Truly, this was more than I had bargained for. And I watched my 52 boys narrowly. I watched their faces, their walk, their unconscious attitudes. For all these are a language, a language given us purposefully, that it may betray us in times of emergency when we have secrets which we want to keep. I knew that thought would keep going all over and over again in their minds and hearts. All of England is marching against us. And ever more strenuously imploring action with each repetition, ever more sharply realizing itself to their imaginations, until even in their sleep they would find no rest from it. But here the vague and flirting creatures of their dreams say, All England, all England is marching against you. I knew this would happen. I knew that ultimately the pressure would become so great that it would compel utterance. Therefore, I must be ready with an answer at this time, an answer well chosen and tranquilizing. I was right. The time came. They had to speak, the poor lads. It was pitiful to see. They were so pale, so worn, so troubled. At first, their spokesman could hardly find voices or words, but presently, got both. This is what he said, and he put it in the neat modern English taught to him in my schools. We have tried to forget what we are, English boys. We have tried to put reason before sentiment, duty before love. Our minds approve, but our hearts reproach us. While apparently it was only the nobility, only the gentry, only the 25 or so 30,000 knights left alive out of the late wars, we were of one mind and undisturbed by any troubling thought. Each and every one of these 52 lads who stand here before you said, They have chosen. It is their affair. But think, the matter is altered. All England is marching against us. Oh, sir, consider, reflect. These people are our people. They are bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. We love them. Do not ask us to destroy our nation. Well, it shows the value of looking ahead and being ready for a thing when it happens. If I hadn't foreseen this thing and been fixed, that boy would have had me. I couldn't have said a word, but I was fixed, and I said, My boys, your thoughts are in the right place. You have thought the worthy thought. You have done the worthy thing. You are English boys. You will remain English boys, and you will keep that name unbesmirched. Give yourselves no further concern. Let your minds be at peace. And consider this, while all England is marching against us, who is in the van? Who, by the commonest rules of war, will march in the front? Answer me. The mounted hosts of mailed knights. True, they are 30,000 strong, acres deep they will march, and now observe, none but they will ever strike the sand belt. Then there will be an episode. Immediately after, the civilian multitude in the rear will retire to meet business engagements elsewhere. None but nobles and gentry are knights, and none but these will remain to dance to our music after that episode. It is absolutely true that we shall have to fight nobody but these 30,000 knights. Now speak, and it shall be as you decide. Shall we avoid battle and retire from the field? No! The shout was unanimous and hearty. Are you, are you, well afraid of those 30,000 knights? The joke brought out a good laugh, and the boys' troubles vanished away, and they went gaily to their posts. Ah, they were darling 32. They were as pretty as girls as well. It's <laughs> creepy, unbelievably creepy. But we get that, that ability here to use power against this noble tradition and all that we see. And then we jump to the end, and, and Twain is absolutely brutal here. We have the 52 boys and Clarence and Hank defending their position against these 25,000 knights. And this is how Twain brutally, brutally describes it. 
One thing seemed to be sufficiently demonstrated. Our current was so tremendous that it killed the victim before the victim could cry out. Pretty soon, we detected a muffled and heavy sound, and the next moment we guessed what it was. It was a surprise and force coming. I whispered, Clarence, go wake up the army. Notify it to wait in silence in the caves for further orders. He was back soon, and we stood by the inner fence and watched the silent lightning do its awful work upon that swarming host. They had created uh, electric barriers for these guys coming in. One could make out but little of detail, but he could note that a black mass was piling itself upon the second fence. That swelling bulk of dead men. Our camp was enclosed with a solid wall of the dead, a bulwark, a breastwork of corpses, you might say. One terrible thing about this thing was the absence of human voices. There were no cheers, no war cries, being intent upon a surprise. These men moved as noiseless, noiselessly as they could, and always when the front rank was near enough to their goal to make it proper for them to begin to get a shout ready, of course they struck the fatal line and went down without testifying. I sent a current through the third fence, now and almost immediately through the fourth and the fifth, so quickly were the gaps filled up. I believe the time was come now for my climax. I believe that the whole army was in our trap. Anyway, it was high time to find out. So I touched a button and I set fifty electric suns aflame on top of the precipice. Land, what a sight! We were enclosed in three walls of dead men. All the other fences were pretty nearly filled with living, who were stealthily working their way forward through the wires. The sudden glare paralyzed this host, petrified them, you might say, with astonishment. There was just one instant for me to utilize their immobility in, and I didn't lose the chance. You see, in another instant, they would have recovered their faculties. Then they would have burst into a cheer and made a rush, and my wires would have gone down before them. But that lost instant lost them their opportunity forever, while even that slight fragment of time was still unspent. I shot the current through all the fences and struck the whole host dead in their tracks. There was a groan you could hear. It voiced the death pang of 11,000 men. It swelled out on the night with awful, awful pathos. A glance showed that the rest of the enemy, perhaps 10,000 strong, were between us and the encircling ditch and pressing forward to the assault. Consequently, we had them all and had them past help. Time for the last act of the tragedy. I fired the three appointed revolver shots, which meant turn on the water. There was a sudden rush and roar, and then in a minute, the mountain brook was raging through the big ditch and creating a river a hundred feet wide and twenty feet deep. Stand to your guns, men! Open fire! And the thirteen Gatling guns began to vomit death into the fated ten thousand. They halted. They stood their ground a moment against the withering deluge of fire, and then they broke faced about, and swept toward the ditch like chaff before a gale. A full fourth part of their force never reached the top of the lofty embankment. The three-fourths reached it and plunged over, to death by drowning. Within ten minutes after we had opened fire, armed resistance was totally annihilated. The campaign was ended. We, fifty-four, were masters. Twenty-five thousand men lay dead around us. How treacherous is fortune? In a little while, say an hour, happened a thing by my own fault, which, but I have not the heart to write, and let the record end here. Right. Unbelievably brutal description. But there is our first modern science fiction. There we have Mark Twain opening up a whole period that we'll see now with people like R.H. Benson, G.K. Chesterton, Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, C.S. Lewis, Ray Bradbury. So it really begins there with Twain. And that fifth school is the school of fabulism. So when we started off this lecture a little over an hour ago, I really thought that we would get to Mechanical for Leibowitz. But I think I want to stop here. I think I've done enough looking at these five schools and I would rather spend our whole time looking at science fiction and fantasy in our next class and getting into 
Mechanical for Leibowitz. And that also gives you time, if you've not read it yet, to read as much as you can of Canical of Leibowitz between now and our class on Thursday. So I will post this today, but I will date it tomorrow. So again, I am recording this from my home office on March 23rd of 2020, but this is for our March 24th class of 2020, the one that would have met tomorrow, Tuesday, from 9.30 to 10.45. Okay, guys, uh, let me just state again, I miss you. I wish we were all together. Uh, this is, at best, a poor substitute, but one that I hope we can make work, and I hope I was coherent and that you guys were able to follow me. So I will get this rendered and posted onto YouTube quickly. Uh, probably the best thing for you to do is subscribe to the YouTube channel. I apologize because there will also be the other classes that I teach. We'll have their classes there too, and I realize you don't want to watch all of those various videos, but I will try and be clear which ones are Christian humanist, which ones are American heritage, which ones are capstone, and uh, then which ones are just my personal ones where I'm doing these goofy little 10 minute blogs, uh, video cast things that I do. Yeah, you, you had no idea your professor was so hip, did you? <laughs> Joking, I'm not hip. Anyway, to all of you, I can envision you and I can see us sitting in our classroom over in lane 236. You guys all look great. And uh, I miss you, and I hope you're doing well. God bless. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, as always, love one another, do the right thing. Until our next class, God bless everybody.